Um, so the, the purpose of this group is to form a coalition and to have a forum where uh, folks discuss and, and sometimes get, most of the time, get information about different issues pertaining to uh, what we identify as minority and under-resourced communities. So uh, communities of color, LGBTQ communities, communities with uh, different abilities, uh, women, or so on. And throughout the year, we uh, tackle different topics, from transportation to food or nutrition uh, or health related to those populations. So uh, I ask everyone to keep the conversations with that in mind, that, that that's the, the, the focus of this meeting. And um, I, every year I try to um, have some sort of a uh, open space for candidates to come. And so for the last couple of years I have done that for both Communities United and for La Soup. Um, this year, because of my job demands and us trying to restructure Community United, United things got a little late, so that's why um, we're, this is our first meeting uh, of 2015. But I wanted to have, um, to set up things a little bit different, um, because I didn't want to have a forum format, and I wanted to have sort of a, just a, a conversation, really, and it's specifically about the topics that we usually talk about, racial justice, social justice, equity, um, things that are sort of at the forefront of our, our conversation. So I wanted to start us out, um, Paul, if you can just maybe just take a little bit of time just introducing yourself and, and, and speaking a little bit of uh, the work that you've been doing in the city, and then we can start with some questions. And now we'll start with some of the questions, and I'll open to folks to ask questions as well. All right, let me, let me make it very short so that we can get into a discussion. Um, for, well, I'm going to go back more than four years ago. Um, back in the 90s, when I was when I was mayor, uh, we focused on five areas that we thought were critical in terms of how to build strong families and strong neighborhoods. And those five areas were housing, transportation, health, and health includes uh, mental health as well as nutrition, quality child care, and then the whole component of education and job performance. And if you look back historically, going all the way back to the 1970s, through the beginning of this century, in terms of, of, of addressing these issues, the city was, was doing a good job. Um, if we look at, for example, academic performance. Through the 90s and through 2005, uh, we were seeing performance gaps closing in the schools. If we look at employment between white and non-white populations, decade by decade, through 2000, uh, greater employment, more people in the workforce, and we, we were making a difference with the strategies that we adapted. Uh, things got very bad around 2008, 2009. The number of things, but the most important variable was the recession. And it's interesting when you talk about race and equity, how the analysis goes. I want to point out that January 3rd, I think it was, in 2007, I'd asked to go to Madison's downtown Rotary to speak. And I was not in office at the time. And I had one, one message. It was the tremendous growth that had taken place in the number of school children since 2000 who were receiving free and reduced lunch programs. And that was happening despite the fact that in other economic indicators we were doing better, still 2007. And if one had done an analysis as to why 
it was because of a growing a growing immigration into Madison. Uh, we were in a period that was being overlooked by many, where Madison's Latino population was more than doubling. Madison's African American population had almost doubled in the prior decade, and um, this this growth uh, was reflected in the difference between Madison's population of adults as opposed to school age children. When we get to the recession. We have a period of about three years where we really bottom out, and then we have a period of recovery, which means that by about 2012, for Madison's middle class and white population, the effects of the recession are passed for most people. For Madison's African American and Madison's Latino, and to a certain degree Asian population, the recession's not over. So when we look at white unemployment, white households below the poverty line, we're basically back to numbers that are before 2005. When we will look at African American and Latino numbers, um, particularly for African Americans, we're still in the middle of the recession. The question is why? Um, in retrospect, I think we have a good understanding. A large part of it has to do with two different factors. One factor is there was a significant African American uh, uh, population who were really adversely affected by something that happened outside of Dane County. And that was the closing of the General Motors plant in Gainesville. From a Madison-centric view that happened in Rock County, that was their problem. It was too bad, but it didn't affect us. Well, lost in that oversimplified analysis is that there were hundreds of families, individuals, who had principal wage earners, who were skilled machinists, mechanics, who either worked at the Janesville GM plant or uh, worked for companies that were suppliers. And when they got hit, there was uh, no place to go. There wasn't any other hiring taking place. The second part of it, which compares to the 90s, 20 years later, what's happening is that there are no longer the kinds of entry-level jobs in Madison businesses that lead to careers. So for example, if somebody started working at the age of 20 or 30 or 40 at a, say, coal store, uh, working in cash register, they could go on to a career path and eventually become a manager, have all kinds of benefits. Those jobs disappeared. The industry and retail had changed. They were now part-time jobs. And they had no career uh, uh, opportunities. Those are two significant things that happened here. That's why uh, the recovery was so disparate. Now, 2011, when I ran, I said city finances, which were a mess, were the first issue because we couldn't do anything without fixing those. And then secondly, we had to go on to the issue of poverty and equity. And there was a great deal of denial. And if you look at the strategies we've adopted, everything from our food initiatives to the community centers, all of these new initiatives are designed to deal with the tr questions that I've, I've addressed here in terms of transportation, health, housing, and so on. I want to just conclude by saying, if you look 
at the disagreements because one of the issues that's come up in this election is my relationship with the city council. I think it's important to understand that these fights were over my efforts to, in effect, redirect the nature of city spending and to get it on a new track and saying we're going to put our money where our values are. Now, the issue of overture funding is behind us, but the first three years of this last administration, there were major issues about how much money was going to overture when there are all these other obligations. But as recently as this year, we continue to have these challenges. Uh, take, for example, the decision by the city council to, without any study, without any contract, without any competition, simply put in $100,000 for the Madison Sports Authority, which does help promote Madison to do good work. But in terms of priorities, I can think of a dozen things more important than the Madison Sports Authority. So that's where we're at. Uh, I predict we will continue to have these disagreements, but I also want to point out that where we've had successes, to a limited degree, it's been where I've taken on the responsibility and had it out over these issues, but to a greater degree, where it's been successful, where we've had community engagement and community leadership. And I simply want to point to the $300,000 that we are now annually spending on the additional bus service to Owl Creek, which came from the neighborhood people and the teenagers who went to La Follette High School making a difference. The same, same thing is true in terms of the additional funding the Meadowwood uh, Community Center and the Meadow Ridge Library. And I predict that we're going to have more of that in the coming years. So. Yeah, no, thank you so much. You gave me like some other, you know, sure. even more, uh, I guess, food for thought here. But I wanted to start out um, by just asking something that is really personal to me, actually. You know, um, this overarched theme that you started us out with the racial disparities, but what is it like to run for mayor, um, and I know you're already a mayor, in a city known for having alarming uh, racial disparities? And I'm just gonna give a little bit of a personal context. I was in a white privilege conference in Louisville, and Reverend Alex Yu was also there, and you know, uh, uh, the, the host pointed out the, the shooting of Tony Robinson. So, Madison is not only a name of a small town in Wisconsin anymore, it's a name that's associated to a lot of good things, but also <coughs> some very disturbing things. And I can only speak of being a person of color in this very divisive neighborhood or community where I don't get privy to hear certain things that are spoken mostly in white contexts. Uh, likewise, you know, um, Folks of color usually speak to certain things uh, with closed doors and not to others. But what is it like to be um, running for office again with with all this division being so apparent? And and I'm sure a lot of people are trying to speak to different issues in your ear a lot. So can you speak a little bit about that? I'm just going to ask you to be. I know it's a it's a long question, but be a little brief because I have a couple more sure. questions. Well. The, the campaign for mayor is making it more difficult to address the issues. And the reason is uh, the question of suspicion, which is what I say or what others say, is it couched in terms of the fact that we have an election on April 7th, or is it very genuine and personal? Um, I was in a, a meeting uh, a week ago uh, with a number of community leaders, including African Americans and Latinos, and a question came up about 
making a statement about some of the recent events and some of the challenges for our young people. And I raised the question as to whether or not I should be making the statements as opposed to community leaders, because I'm concerned because I'm concerned that anything I say may be mm -hmm. interpreted in the context of the election. The rest of the people in the room were actually more committed to my saying something than, than, than I was. Now, uh, <coughs> let, me, let me put it this way. When I hear people saying that Madison's a racist city, I, I hold up my hand and say, wait a second. Let's rethink that. When I hear people saying Madison is not a racist city, I hold up my hand and say, wait a second. Let's think about that. And the reason is, there's a real problem with generalizations to begin with. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and secondly, it depends on the context and to the issue. Um, there is people making the, the, the uh, or, or transcending the obvious. So, for example, what happens uh, in faith-based uh, communities, Madison does a fine job in regards to addressing the questions of race. If we talk about um, the ethic in our public schools and the way our teachers address these issues, we, we do a good job. If we talk about um, commitment to organizations who are designed to deal with disparity, we do a good job. But when it comes time to dealing with institutional racism, institutional built-in discrimination, we don't always recognize it. So can I ask a clarifying question? So when you say we do a good job in education and, and community uh, faith uh, organizations, what exactly are you talking about the doing a good job? Is the uh, let's, let's, let's talk about, let's, let's deal with the schools because I think the schools produce the good of what I'm talking about, and also the contradiction. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the schools, as part of the curriculum, as part of the way our teachers address the questions of, of race, when you go into classrooms and you see uh, the visuals, the pictures, mm -hmm. the statements uh, from, from Dr. King. So the environment. I think the, that, that environment okay. uh, is, is, a, is a healthy one. But then, when we look at the institution, when we talk about how many African American and Latino uh, and Latina teachers, um, we've got a different issue. Mm -hmm. When we talk about a, uh, a policy that has certain standards that leads to automatic suspensions mm -hmm. without drilling down and figuring out what the consequences of the disparate impact is, we've got another problem. So that's one example with the schools. Now let's take some Madison businesses. We've got some Madison businesses and their foundations that do a marvelous job of writing out checks supporting uh, Central Hispano's annual dinner, the Urban League's uh, activities, things of that sort. But then, when you take a walk through their workforce, through the hallways, and you look into the offices, you don't see in action the diversity that you expect. So we've, we've got this enormous uh, hill we've got to climb, where we've got to take the rhetoric and the, the, the hope and change it into reality. That's the contradiction of Madison. So uh, we have only a few minutes left, and I, I, I wanted to ask one more question, and I just want to open to folks. But regarding the systemic change, what would what would you like to accomplish by the end of your term? Well, 
let's let's talk about uh, some of the most important disparity gaps. And I want to go back to one more example when I when I when I get into this. Um, I'd like to see that the city's efforts to work with the school district, particularly with our out-of-school time activities, where we know that out-of-school time is very critical to the academic success of our students, and that's another area of disparity, where middle-class kids, principally white, have all these activities after school, on the weekends, during vacations, that make enormous contributions to their growth and their maturity, their development and their academic success, then when we look at, at, at African American kids, Asian kids, Latino kids, they don't have those same opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. Uh, secondly, in regards to, to economics, we've made enormous strides in employment and the commitments that have been made, made in the last year and a half. Going from about two dozen to 125 and now 800 summer youth jobs. That's a nice way to count, by the way. <laughs> so the, the progress in terms of those summer youth jobs is fantastic. And I would hope that by the end of, of 2019, we'll have met what I call the Boston goal. Every single teenager who wants a summer youth job will have one. The third, and then the same thing is true in terms of adult employment. This recent United Way initiative, which the city helped spark, in which we are a participant, creating 200 full-time living wage jobs is critical, and I hope that number becomes 1,000. Then I want to go back to the area of health. We had something called Harambe at the South Madison uh, Community and Health Center, Community Health Center. Mm -hmm. And for a seven year period, African American infant mortality, which was at national levels, dropped successively every year for seven years <coughs> to the point where it was actually lower than white infant mortality. I mean, where in the United States do you see that? Now, to me, by the way, that would not happen in a community that was racist. We made a real effort <coughs> to deal with that, 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 that it, to, with, with, with health altogether. But then, someone at City Hall declared victory, disbanded Harambe, stopped funding it, and sure enough, yeah. Over the next three, four years, after that was done, African American infant mortality started creeping up again. And the point is, they didn't understand from an institutional perspective why black infant mortality had dropped and what the consequences was of dissolving Harambe. Because it had nothing to do with the medical professionals. It had to do with African American women playing a major role in connecting the medical establishment to young African American women who were pregnant. And that in turn made the delivery of the system far better. But what wasn't understood was their role in building trust and creating access. And I might add, we are back on track to reestablish Harambe. Paul, given the kind of emphasis on the danger of generalizations, which is absolutely true, it seems to me <coughs> as I've looked at the shootings here in Madison as well as Ferguson and all over, there are three variables that seem to come into play. One is testosterone, one is race, and one is higher groups. And two of those are fairly hardwired and they're big systemic issues. Firearms, however, is maybe something more manageable and understandable, and I'm wondering whether or not you think it might be profitable to initiate some discussion in our community 
about the role of firearms, especially within police, as to whether that they're helpful or hurtful in terms of being peacekeepers or law enforcement, and knowing, noting that there are 11 countries or dominions, including England, Norway, Switzerland, um, Iceland, that do have police with empty holsters. And it, it seems to me that that right. might be an interesting way of diffusing, but also expanding and encompassing. I think in, in, in a perfect world, and I'm not saying that hypothetically, because I believe in reality it would work, if we were to have the gun control laws that those other nations have, mm -hmm. with the restrictions on, on the accessibility of firearms, it would not be necessary to have police officers with firearms. Um, unfortunately, since the year where I tried to ban handguns in the city of Madison, the preemption of local control and where our state leaders and our federal leaders are taking us is in the exact opposite wrong direction. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing, going back to your analysis, uh, when we examine um, all right, and, I, and I, I, I'm not in the position since we don't have the report on, 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 the, on the tragedy involving Tony Robinson, but when we look at some of these other situations, there are a number of variables which are controllable and not within the hands of the police department. They specifically have to deal with substance abuse, and mental illness. Um, the one of the one of the, the, the shootings um, that I can think of it was it was a year ago in May involved an individual who was clearly disturbed who had killed a mother and then killed the woman's daughter. Um, Another call was prompted by someone indicating that, that, that the subject was mentally ill. Uh, and we're pretty sure in at least one other case there was mental illness. In all these instances, one of the things that's a common factor is that when the officer tells the individual to either put down the weapon or to stop a Approaching either the officer or other people, the individual doesn't listen, and it's almost. It, 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 it seems to me that it's an issue of impairment, either mental illness or substance. In which case, that all occurred before the officer got there, and it's a reflection of the inadequacy of our community, of our state, and of our nation to address these issues. And, parenthetically, who is least likely to get help with these issues? Mm -hmm. It's going to be people without health insurance, and it's going to be people who are of color. So I think it's got to be addressed from, from that standpoint as well. Um, the, the real challenge for us as a community, if we're asking what can be done to make sure that this doesn't happen again, or we at least reduce significantly the possibility of it not happening again, I think is in part going to come up as the city council initiates this discussion about police practices, policies, and standards and procedures, but it also has to come up with a discussion of the issue of mental illness and substance abuse. Because when you look at so many of these instances, not just in Madison, but around the state and around the country, that's the underlying view. Um, the responsibility is not being met within Wisconsin. Uh, the time to schedule an appointment 
for example, here in Dane County through Journey Mental Health, <coughs> is up to a year, minimum of six months waiting, unless you know how to game the system and you've got an advisor to help you get in early. Uh, our, our reputation as one of the most uh, intoxicated states in regards to um, binge drinking is not something to be proud of. And there is very, very little that we are doing for teenagers. Uh, one of the discussions we're having in my office right now has to do with the fact that a private uh, club called Wally Gators went out of business and has never been replaced. And the school district's loft is gone and has never been replaced. There is no place for teenagers to gather and hang out. And believe it or not, part of growing up is hanging out. Mm -hmm. yeah, the same yeah, space. Um, and, uh, sure. Uh, it was interesting you, you bring up the uh, gentleman last year, and, and it's a legitimate concern to mental health. Um, uh, actually, his sister attends this particular CDO, uh, is one of, one of the leaders here. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, some CBOs, particularly this one, is, is to address those issues regarding the teenagers not having anything to do, or even the families who, you know, in some cases we have information about these particular issues. Um, and so it is a legitimate concern, and I do applaud, um, you know, your efforts to address the after school uh, type of things and hope that, you know, uh, there are opportunities to share some of the the, the uh, real key uh, things that we think will help to to address this. And it may not be overnight, but it's something that that is a big issue. Uh, one question that I wanted to to ask, uh, because I've heard of the the thought of biometric pistols, you know, because if, if you're dealing with someone who's not listening or there's some other things that are happening, you know, it's understandable that an officer wouldn't want someone to get a hold of the pistol. So is this something that that is possible? We yes, talk about a resources here or you know to help to eat to 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 relieve that anxiety that goes with an already tough job. I'm sure that's one of the things that the committee will be looking at with the police department. Yes, because one of the you know one of one of the key elements for for an officer is you cannot let someone else get a hold of your firearm, and sometimes uh, that has tragic results. Well, um, I want to go back to a couple things. Um, you know, you mentioned the access, but you know, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot is, um, and you, I'm sure you're very aware of that as well, is that folks don't get uh, often can't get the resources, the mental health, and the substance abuse help until they're in the system. So for young people, is either um, CPS or juvenile justice, and for older people, is actual yes. incarceration. <coughs> and and, and, and let, let me, let me expand it. Whether we're talking mental health, whether we're talking substance abuse, whether we're talking violations of the law, where the system is broke, is in all these areas, and, 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 and since we've got somebody from, from, from REAP here, let me also expand it to questions of nutrition and health. What happens is we don't get interventions early enough in any of these instances, um, and, and that the system is designed to start working things get really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the tragedy of it. Um, there's some things that we can easily take care of. For example, there are additional nutrition programs 
that are available during the summer for when kids aren't in school. We haven't fully taken advantage of those, and we will, starting this summer, uh, expand summer nutrition programs. The bottom line is hungry kids do not learn. Next, in terms of criminal justice, we've got a system that only addresses <coughs> the worst case scenarios. Now we're trying with something new here, which is the uh, South Madison, uh, the South Madison uh, court, restorative justice, justice court. Thank you. So that's that that is one alternative to 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 make. Is your difference. office supporting that? Because I know it's a yes. non-union issue. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're we're working with, with I mean, Captain Ballas of Madison okay. Police Department is 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 is. is fully engaged in it. But again, when we start talking about teens, and let's talk about another aspect of this which hasn't come up, teenage suicide. Um, there's a combination of factors where ignoring the problem has such tragic and disastrous consequences. And being a teenager, uh, being a teenager without resources, uh, you know, the, it, 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 it's a really bleak world out there. And that's one of the, 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 again, the challenges we've got. I don't know how we get the resources. We've got a state government that doesn't believe in spending money on these things. We've got federal government uh, I'll mention one more thing. We've got a significant number of people in Madison who have jobs that end after midnight or after 10 p.m. when there's no longer bus service in certain areas. Right now, there's a service through the YWCA that while these folks can get to work at 4 o'clock or at 5 o'clock because of the bus service, there's a transportation system administered by the YWCA to get them home at night. That service is once again in serious trouble because of loss of funding. Yeah, so I have one more, um, and I think Scott is in a yes. way or close here. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a, a something that it, I feel like it doesn't require necessary resources, but I wanted to talk, or maybe you can talk a little bit about the impact on communities of color because. There's a lot of conversation about what it is happening and what is not happening, and but I think to me, the most important, um, you know, way to frame it is that how communities of color view specifically. I'm talking about policing, and I am a resident of the South Side. I was in the city, and now uh, own a property in the town, um, but had my 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 apartment raided. You know, had several contacts with police. Uh, I'm a working mom. Um, I you know, try to abide the law. I, I run some, you know, stoplights sometimes and, and, and when I'm not gonna say that I'm, you know, completely always, you know, law, but I, I try for the most part. But, you know, um, I have gray hair. I don't look, you know, that young anymore. And, and I still have quite a bit of uh, some not, some negative, in, you know, interactions with the police and very traumatizing actually. Um, and had to, you know, had prevent my daughter uh, to have some interaction with, you know, uh, folks with already armed, ready to shoot, uh, kind of thing. And I feel like that's the impact in a lot of the conversations of, of other communities of color, specifically folks on the south side, but I know on the north side as well. What What are some of the things that your office, or you in particular, uh, can do as far, as far as reframing some of this impact or, or addressing some of this impact? Well, the biggest, the biggest effort we've got, and I think it's the most important one, is our neighborhood resource teams. And the middle word is resource. Neighborhood resource teams do not run the neighborhood. They are a resource to the neighborhood. They only work when there are engaged leaders within the neighborhood and community who set the standards, who set the expectations, and eventually, I hope, 
set the priorities for city spending, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, is critical. Those neighborhood resource teams include police officers and public health staff, firefighters and housing staff, bus drivers, and community development staff. I think the, the solution to all of this, the five areas I talked about, and the trust that you're really talking about is by building strong neighborhoods. And that's what the city ought to be doing every day. That is the ultimate solution. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone right. for the questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thanks. And we're just having um, sort of very informal just meeting and I have some prompting questions for mm -hmm. you and then I'll ask them when I'll open to, um, to folks to talk a little bit about um, uh, issues pertaining social justice, racial justice, and equity, which is what um, I think you've been at one of a couple yes, of the meetings yeah. before, so you know how I, I like to frame the, the, the conversations that we do here. Um, so one, the first question and I wanted to ask you is, what is it like to run for mayor uh, in a city known for having alarming racial disparities? And I'll contextualize it, give an example, Earlier I was in Louisville at a white privilege conference and Reverend Alex, she was there and it was called out on the podium about the shooting with Tony Robinson and, and Madison and the alarming with your disparities. And Madison uh, stopped being this uh, small city in Wisconsin to be an example for sometimes good things but often uh, in a context of, of alarming with your disparities and worse communication and whatnot. So what is it like for you to be engaging in this race? Well, it, it, it's more than just this race, but it's it's being an elected leader where you know that racial disparities are 11 to 1 with African American men compared to Caucasian men. Uh, you see the services that are in South Madison, you compare those same services to the downtown in the Isthmus. Uh, the disparity rates in our community are alarming. Uh, you see that not only as you're running for mayor of Madison, but just as a member of the city council. Uh, you know, the nation put Madison under the microscope. And as you saw the issues that occurred on March 6th, or what occurred on March 6th, it was individuals throughout the country who were calling to say, what's going on in Madison? How does something like this occur? Mm -hmm. The devastating element to that. And to many of the you know, many individuals who are looking for answers, looking for solutions, looking for results, and the fact of the matter is, many of the issues that people are experiencing, uh, that not only those connected with Tony and his family, but racial disparities in Madison, are something that I've never experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two Caucasian men saying, "You're looking for us for answers." But it, what it takes is a community of those who you are listening to, those reaching out to, saying, these are the needs that we have in this community. What would be your first decision to promote equity in our city? Uh, I, I go back to some of the conversations that I've had early on when I was deciding to run with folks like Reverend Everett Mitchell, with Alex, as you mentioned, and the issues that they said, here are the areas to focus on immediately. Uh, that right now the city could be providing, but we're not doing enough of. Uh, they focused it really on five particular areas. Uh, one was child care, transportation, jobs, building a strong safety net, and finally dealing with issues of incarceration. Uh, and the systemic issues on that front. So if you were to say the first area, it would be child care. Uh, my wife, who sits on the One City Learning Board, uh, as we're dealing with child care, particularly in South Madison, when only one third of the families have access to affordable child care. And for a mother who may be trying to decide, do I send some of my child to child care? Do I try to find a relative or a friend who can watch that person or take a job work that's bound, it can be a very difficult decision uh, for families. Uh, and then we also know is sending children into the Madison School District on equal footing. And when you look at the child care opportunities, as education starts very early on, uh, and seeing what the city could do there. 
So when it comes to not only having more scholarships available and partnership opportunities, but providing seed funding for daycares to open, uh, making sure that business coordination, because as we other cities have found, the same person who's great to open a childcare is not the same exact person to deal with the accounting right. or the legal work and all of the other various issues that go into just even providing daycare. So I believe that's the first area to focus on. I'm going to open to focus on the I'll raise the question. I mean, <coughs> and that is, it seems to me with these various the shootings and the killings by police departments, there are three variables that I see identified as are relevant. One is testosterone, mm -hmm. one is race, and one is firearms, lethal weapons. Two of those things are fairly hardwired, it feels to me, and, and difficult issues to address and an ongoing concern. But the question of fireworks, firearms, and the availability of them and the use of them by our police department as to whether police departments are law enforcement or peacekeepers seems to be a discussion that the mayor could facilitate or lead in regardless of what the external issues are and I know there's all kinds of stuff about gun control this that or the other but if we reenact all those things and rethink of them and if there wasn't that firearm there it would seem to me it would lead to a lot of different outcomes now, I'm just curious as to your thoughts yeah, so my mother previously worked for a police academy, so she could talk about this in the same way that I would, would as well. But when it comes to use of force by law enforcement agents, and you see the acceleration of the use of force. Lethal force. And lethal force, but even the presence that police officers enter a situation with a very dominant perspective of it creates more hostile situations. You know, it's not the element of de-escalation. So when you look at the elements of what our policies show, both of the use of force, uh, but what we could be doing in the ways our law enforcement could be trained to continue to de-escalate that force going into a situation. Uh, there are use of tasers. Uh, I know a decent amount about taser technology, and I can see just at least on the basis I understand why it may not have worked in this situation. Uh, but there are other forms of technology uh, and just training protocols that may have made a different circumstance happen on, on March 6th. I hope the city of Madison continues not only just saying that we're doing a task force, but actually reviewing the policies and the protocols to say, how do we improve this? How do we become that model city nationwide? Because you can start to say, well, we're no different than any other community. And I think that's a horrible excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that we're not setting the bar for our own law enforcement high enough. So, you know, that's a difficult conversation. You know, we still have over 450 police officers, um, you know, that are on the force. I think it's a, a different situation that happened several years prior. But I think now is the time where you're seeing the community energy behind saying, as leaders, let's bring forward serious reform. Um, one of the other issues that you know, I do run into is even looking at the statistics and trying to figure out where are we compared to not only our peer cities, but have racial disparities lowered in the last, you know, decreased in the last year, in the last 18 months, and much of that data is not available to the general public. And as someone who's very much about data transparency, I'm looking for answers just like everybody else in the community. That's a good question. What is your uh, I guess primary inspiration for seeking the, the office of the mayor? What What is it that's driving you? What's prompt you? I mean, any issues that you see or something that you think you can make it better? Yeah, so I, I, I had that question a lot. Folks get to know a little bit more about my background. So I started a tech company about eight years ago. I go to an office that has floor to ceiling windows of the lake. It's a really good life that uh, right now has afforded my, my <coughs> wife and my family. But I see what, you know, I, I see the same reason why I joined the city council. I absolutely love waking up to public service. 
And you see what you can do in the private sector when you're trying to help out, whether it's with a cause or an organization. You might be able to donate a little bit of money here or there. But when you see the entire city working towards an end goal, taking on a real challenge and trying to figure out how can we be innovative, how do we lead from a local level, there's nothing more exciting. So as someone who had the opportunity to serve you know, District 8, which is the city council seat that I represent for four years, and seeing when we are working together, when we are trying to tackle problems, you can have such a larger impact as Madison mayor as you can on anything else. So uh, it's why I sought to give up that entire nice lifestyle of private sector and say, this is what I want to focus uh, with my time um, this is how I want to focus my time. Um, just a question, Scott. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was going to bring it up, but we didn't have time with Paul, yeah. but I have talked about this with Paul before, so I know his answer. But um, I'm right now part of a, a group, community group, that was put together to talk about issues of equity in Spain. This is the step up. Mm -hmm. And um, several of the things that we are talking about, more than anything is, the concept of implicit bias. And a lot of the inequities, implicit bias is something that is part of it, including, I believe, the reactions many times of police officers that do not, you know, have this competence to understand where people of color in particular say, black men um, are coming from, okay? I don't know how to deal with that. Uh, one of the things is, is what's called anchoring bias. So they rely on a piece of information or a stereotype to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And that transfers into hiring, transfers into making decisions about funding, like we were talking about before. So what is your, and one of the reasons for implicit bias is because people haven't had the opportunity to really understand other people, to have it been there with other people different than themselves, mm -hmm. to understand where they're coming from, what are their thought process, what are their, their culture of, you know, uh, uh, their, their cultural um, perspectives, mm -hmm. how they act, act or react. And that, what is in your background of, you know, other than, you know, having been in the, in the council where all these things come up. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your experience working with diverse communities that will inform you to, to, to think yourself not to, to, to have this implicit bias. Implicit bias is unconscious bias. Yeah. It's, not, it's not explicit. It's not because mm -hmm. somebody's racist or we're talking about, but it's because you don't think about it mm -hmm. unless you, you really understand it. And, and it's because you don't have the shared experience. Exactly. With someone else across from there you who may have experienced. And, and how I tackled that, you know, I've seen this in a couple different areas. I mean, in, in academia, you start to see it as, well, you can't just learn something that, because it's in a book. You can't mm -hmm. just read about right. someone else's plight or someone else's experiences mm -hmm. and say that you really know that. Um, I go to actually my first meeting with Alex uh, when I, after reading Justified Anger, went to Nehemiah. It wasn't, it wasn't my goal to say, hey, come downtown. Well, you go out to the community. And we sat there, and the first hour, we talked about our experiences traveling to Israel. Because we saw a picture of him. <coughs> I just come back from Israel. He had gone several years prior. But then it's building that friendship and then learning firsthand experiences of what someone else is experiencing. And not trying to sit, go into a meeting with an agenda or saying, I have every single answer. Because the reality is, if you go into a meeting like that, you won't, one, you probably don't, and you don't actually understand a problem that someone else is facing. In many of my interactions, whether it's in the South Side or it's involving race, I understand, at the very least, I've never experienced the same shared experiences as many others in the community. What I can do to combat that is say, what can I listen to? What are other policy ideas that I might know from my expertise to say, this may have an area where we'd be able to help out. Uh, one of the pieces that we created in the private sector uh, through a couple different tech companies, uh, essentially it was the Urban League who said, come out, you know, 
that we don't see any kind of technology leadership in the urban league, and that's, but come out to the urban league. What we ended up doing was inviting 12 CEOs just to have a roundtable discussion at the urban league to say, what can we do to expand technology, particularly uh, when you see the, you know, the disparities in technology, which are way worse than anything we're talking about here, where you see a Caucasian male workforce of 90% in some cases, and saying, what can we do to promote it? First thing that we found out out of the 12 CEOs that were there, only 10 of them, uh, out of the 10 of them had never been to South Nicholson before. So that's the first thing that we discovered. But what came out of that was a program called the YWEB program, uh, which is now through the YWCA. We've taken 30 students, uh, primarily uh, people of color as well as women, to say, we're going to teach you how to program. While you're in the program, we're going to provide childcare, we're going to provide transportation, we're going to have a mentality that you cannot fail in this setting. You end up learning programming from one of the best teachers in the entire state, a guy named Jim Remsnick, uh, and he will teach you how to program. And that's created 30 jobs. After the graduation of that program, everybody receives an internship at a technology company. So it's one of these very small pieces, and that's on a very micro scale, but to say, all right, these are all the different pieces to actually get someone employed at a tech company. Um, so I would say that goes to how I usually operate. Uh, it's not coming in to a decision to say I have an answer. It's saying, how do we all come up with a solution to move forward? So one of the questions, one of your comments, I mean, a lot of your comments had to do with uh, some interventions and some program, but I want to go back to the systemic level. Uh, what is one systemic change would you like to accomplish by the end of your term if you elected it by uh, for the year? I would like to see our serious issues with transportation addressed in, in Madison. You know, we talk about you know, bus rapid transit, and it's a great issue if you live on the bus rapid transit line on the near west side or the near east side. But for a majority of the users of our public transportation system, it's those individuals who actually need public transportation where it becomes their main form. Uh, you see communities in, this, in the north side, in the south side, the west side. My wife was talking about uh, an employee who came in looking for a job. She wanted to give that person a job, but knowing taking public transportation for her line of work would be nearly impossible. So that person would be in transit nearly two hours of their day. And it becomes very tough for employment. Mm -hmm. So many different issues come down to transportation. Uh, so to see serious reforms, and that's going to be uh, even beyond conversations with bus rapid transit, but addressing those issues of the headway times to take, just even from, to get from South Madison to downtown. You know, the other way, and I go back to the moments where I've actually felt like we've had an integrated community, because so often you'll see programming that's downtown, whether it's concerts on the square, whether it's folks, you know, things over at Overture Center, you still don't see a community that actually values, I don't want to say other community actually united in mm -hmm. so many of our public programming of the city of Madison. Take a look at the Madison Mar uh, mini marathon that's going to happen, and take a look at just, is it as d diverse of our own community? And the answer is going to come back as no. Mm -hmm. So to see different areas where we can take down the silos, we can break down those barriers, and that's going to take more than just a mayor. But if we're seeing that kind of improvement and showing that we have that kind of, and knowing deep down that we've made progress, I think that would be an amazing accomplishment that will take more than four years, but something to strive for. Yeah. Ask your, your thoughts or your reaction to the idea or the concept of white privilege. Is that something, is that a concept you're aware of? Yes. Is it, and what's your thoughts regarding its it, existence, it, its impact, its pervasiveness? It absolutely, it absolutely exists. And I actually were having this conversation recently on the South Side as we were talking about um, times where I may have gotten in trouble with the law and I've never had to worry about what that interaction is like or even possibly running for very simple things going wrong. There's the issue of white privilege, whether it is in hiring, whether it is in the job market, whether it's just how I show up in a room looking to network with someone, how someone may approach me versus someone else in the community. 
uh, it absolutely exists. And it's addressing those kind of biases throughout our entire system. Uh, it, it needs to be addressed. Um, getting to how we address that and making sure everyone, both in the country and away, you know, in, in the city, understand that these biases do exist is a much larger challenge. So I gave um, Paul uh, Soglin, um some time to talk, to sort of introduce himself. And mm -hmm. then I, I didn't do that to you because we were in transition, but why don't I, why don't I just finish that way? You just take your time and just kind of talk a little bit about you and, and your platform and, and things that you like to achieve. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I'll, you get to have those kind of very early conversations, you know, earlier in an election. Mm -hmm. um, but, but at this point, I mean, I'll tell you about myself. I'm someone who grew up in a middle-class family in Wausau, Wisconsin. You know, we all have our own shared stories. I came to Wisconsin because my dad lost his job. Uh, he was in the radio business, and when you change formats and you, lose, you have to go to a place that's never heard your voice, and that place where my father was in Wausau, Wisconsin. Came to Wausau, that's where I was raised. A uh, very homogeneous population up in Wausau. Uh, you start to see what it means to be a Democrat up there is a lot different than being a Democrat here. Um, I could say that from my political experience. Wanted to come to a city uh, that you would have plentiful opportunities. Uh, this was the school that I could afford. Uh, I wanted to say a place where public education was valued, and this is the place where around the state people are envious to come to, which is Madison, Wisconsin. Came here for school, started a company out of the dorms, First company uh, failed pretty miserably. We were running illegally off the UW Humanities servers. We were trying to be a broadband television company. Uh, we made about $50 over the course of nine months, split eight ways. So not exactly that promising success story, but the second company now that we ended up creating about eight years ago still has 22 employees. And still the things that I'm proud of there is it won uh, Two years ago, it was the best one of the best places to work in Madison. And she starts seeing employees come in to say, hey, I'm buying my first house. I'm buying a car. I'm starting a family right here. Uh, about 18 months ago, I was married to my high school sweetheart over at Overture Center. So even throughout the entire race, uh, we're still married, which I, <laughs> which is very, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to have her by my side. And it's been trying to figure out how to have a better community for everyone. Being able to listen to stories and trying to use my limited knowledge to bring people together to try to solve Madison's biggest issues. Whether we're trying to tackle issues of homelessness, whether we're trying to tackle what to do with public resources or funding, being someone who will be respectful, uh, that will listen and think of what can Madison become if we're all working together, listening to new ideas, and not just resting on our laurels, but being that progressive community uh, that that's, is the beacon for the rest of the country. I know we've been there in our past, and it's figuring out how we're going to continue to grow and be there in the future. Thank you. Um, there was one last question that I asked, mm -hmm. Paul, and I would like to ask you too, is uh, regarding the impact on, um, in particular among communities of color. You know, we there's a lot of debate of what what happens uh, based on different um, different folks responding different, uh, but there is also the impact, and I'll be a little bit more clear regarding uh, policing, for example, in the neighborhoods, and whether or not there is, you know there's the same number of officers or not. But reality is um, the impact among communities of color is that there is an over policing, and I'll share uh, a personal. Um, story. I, I live in the south side. I used to live in the city and now I'm just right on the border there in the town of Madison. And I had my my apartment raided. Uh, have been had quite a few interactions with police. Uh, I try to be, you know, abiding a lot for the most part. Can't say that I haven't run a couple of stoplights my in my life. Um, but had had some interactions that I felt very fearful, um, very negative, very traumatic. For myself and also for my daughter. So, so what are some of the things that you think that that we that a mayor can do uh, that can be really tangible? That's beyond resources and funding and 
you know, the state of politics. Well, you know, we we're having a conversation of does over policing exist? And this was from the Young Gifted and Black mm -hmm. pre presenting this issue very eloquently. Uh, so, what do I do when I hear an issue? I end up reaching out to a, a church leader, a uh, person of color, who said, does over policing exist? And there wasn't even, you know, the hesitation of mm -hmm. trying to be, it does. Mm -hmm let me tell you. And then we started hearing the stories of someone in particular, uh, the first story he said as an officer just simply asking individuals, well, do you live here? Is this your place of residency? So to hear these stories over and over of someone who lives in the neighborhood, you can tell that it does exist. Mm -hmm. Now, how you address those types of issues are a bigger challenge. Uh, one of the ideas taken from another community is to make sure that every single police precinct has a non-binding board of residents who sit and meet with the lieutenants and the captains of that precinct on a regular basis. Not just on an annual basis, but more of a monthly basis to have that kind of non-binding board to say, this is occurring in our community. And it needs to come from just residents as well because you look at what soft interactions look like in our legal system, and the spending on that officer's um, 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 it depending on that officer's discretion, someone on the south side may face a different type of citation or a different type of form through the legal system, whether that same exact incident was happening on Langdon Street on campus. And we're simply, in this case, we're talking about how does an officer respond if you see someone drinking on the sidewalk? And you can see all of the different pathways forward, but to make sure our residents are being treated equally. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a fair balance all the way through because there are also different policing issues in the North Precinct versus the South mm -hmm. Precinct as well. Yeah. So you need to have enough flexibility where officers are able to respond to their community because well, let's face it, if you call 911 for a situation, you do want officers to be able to respond in a timely manner. And we do need some role of law enforcement in our lives, but the complaints, when you not only see the end result of the disparities of the 11 to 1 arrest rates, and then you say, is there over policing in the community? At least antidotally, we are looking at the answer of yes. But I guess I yeah. Maybe you have better insight to, yeah. Well, um, it, it, it's struggling to all times because times have changed, unfortunately. I'm talking about policing. Is this, you seen this commercial American Family, the one about sometime, you know, that, that's <laughs> Yes, 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 yeah. And what struck me is this police officer with the baton that is clearly a neighborhood police officer, clearly a neighborhood police officer, Police officers used to be a neighborhood assigned. They knew who lived there. They knew them, right? So in many instances, they wouldn't have to ask somebody, do you live here? Right. Because they would know them, right? I don't know if there's not enough resources or it's a different system of policing, because to me, for example, when Joe Bales goes to the you know, Leopold area, everybody knows mm -hmm. him. He knows everybody. They don't, he doesn't need to ask. Mm -hmm. This is one thing that I think is missing. People knowing and trusting their neighborhood police just the way that they might trust their neighborhood, you know, a grocery person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a great, it, it's a great point. I mean, I actually go back to, a, so I lost one of my neighborhood police officers who was downtown, his name was Grant, and when it was time for his promotion, I was just like, yeah, he's a great officer, amazing. And then I learned he's going over to the north side. <laughs> yeah, right. I wanted to go back to say, no, I miss Grant. I want him in Central. Right. But it's trying to keep, and I think you are hitting on a really good piece, but trying to keep officers inside the same district. Uh, and, and that's hard as officers are also looking for role and stuff. Yes. And when an officer wants to promote, and not that I don't want to stop Grant from becoming a detective they, they because course. he's a great officer. But it is, you know, it is, it is tough. But I knew Grant knew 
For me, it was the fraternity presidents who caused a lot of it. Not that they caused, oh, they caused certain types of issues regularly right, right. in my district, but he knew every single threat president. Right, right. And he knew when someone was acting out of line, who to call first, and it wasn't always calling back up, it was, mm -hmm. I know who to call to make right. sure the situation exactly. is eliminated. And that's what we want our officers to do more times than not. Not necessarily write every single ticket that they can write. Mm -hmm. It's just to make sure behaviors are modified when it's necessary. And fraternities have behaviors that should not be occurring. So yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. something I think about that. I it's wonder if, if Tony would be alive if the police officer that responded was the neighborhood police officer. Mm -hmm. That not only Tony knew him, regardless of what the situation that, that Tony was, but this police officer knew him. Like, how different would he have reacted to Tony? See what I mean? Oh, yeah. I don't know. The, the joke Just was my community, so because my mom was involved in police training, my dad was in the radio business, they happened to know a lot of police officers, particularly in Merrill, Wisconsin. And I know anybody, if I did anything wrong up and back at home, that officer would know exactly who I am. Right. And they're probably calling my parents before I'm getting involved in the legal system. I understand that as the city grows and it's harder. It's to do. harder, but in some instances that might be something that would help. I think. Anyway, yeah, so, I think, so right. yeah, I think what you two are describing is what Reverend Cooper mentioned about neighborhood off uh, neighborhood policing versus community policing. So that's a good way to end our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott, for being here. I just want to open for announcements, and I know there is one. Do you want? To speak to this? Um, so on Saturday, April 11th, there is going to be a South Madison visioning, uh, visioning and it's going to happen here. There will be performance, free food, it's open to the public, and it's free. Mm -hmm. um, and is art for the community by the community. Uh, so there's going to be different panels and different arts uh, happening here on Saturday, April 11th. And I just want to open, is there any other announcements? Uh, from anyone? Do you want to talk about what is the next Latino Education Council? Oh, we have been working with the school district, and uh, Jane Cheatham is going to be uh, presenting her plan, and uh, hopefully, if the referendum passes, what we're mm -hmm. going to do with that. Um, April 18 at Central Span. Yeah. So, if anybody wants to attend, it's open. She's more than willing to, to listen. She wants input. It's not just to present, she wants input what her plan is. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll send it on, on the Community yes. United okay. website. Okay. Ron, you have any, uh, Just curious, are we going to, is the plan to get back onto a so, monthly yes, routine I, or I'm what, what's up? Yes, I'm trying to think if April, if I wanted to have a special meeting again where we'll talk about what we wanted to do for the rest of the year because I, I need to get some more input. So be, between now and, and uh, April, next month, next week, this week, um, if we can do like a survey and get some more input and then I know um, thank you so much uh, Zion City for opening the doors um, here and to see if we wanted to change the location or if you know I, I haven't talked to the new this some transition at Urban League as well so I haven't spoke to them either whether or not they have interest in continue to having us there and I know uh, we kind of outgrew there a little bit with the, the parking and all that stuff it was a little bit of challenge so I think there's kind of multiple conversations happening there, and I'll try to make announcements promptly. So, well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you so much, Brenda, for.